Let's have a look see at the Milwaukee Thermal Imager. This here's model 2257-20, assembled in USA with domestic and foreign parts. This model is the one that takes a 9 volt battery, it's not the M12 version. I gotta say my enthusiasm right up front, not many tools combine utility, simplicity, and just plain fun to fuck around with in one package. That is, it's just incredible. And the price is fantastic. These thermal imagers normally are going for well over a thousand dollars, and this model here, I got it on eBay for 200 bucks Canadian. American, that's gotta be like only 50 cents. So I'm going to divide this video into four parts. First part is I'm going to do a little bit of a preamble as to what exactly a thermal imager is and what, 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 what it's accomplishing. Second part, I want to look at the outside of this particular tool. Third part, I'm going to rip it open and see what's inside. And the fourth part, maybe I'll do a little bit of usage notes and show you what, what it can do, what it can't do. So a thermal imager uses a chip inside the lens here, which is rather like a, a chip that's inside a digital camera. Except instead of being sensitive to, to visible light, this chip is sensitive to infrared light. Now such an imaging chip doesn't require a light source. And the reason why is everything, everything glows light. As long as it's not absolute zero, which nothing in the universe is absolute zero, as long as it's above absolute zero, it, it glows. Take the sun for instance. The sun is bloody hot like 5,000 degrees Celsius, it's more than that, more than 5,000 degrees Celsius, and at that temperature it's white hot, and the sun, well, it glows white. Yeah, a little bit cooler in temperature, like you like your element on your oven or something like that, it, it, it glows red because it's maybe only 2,000 degrees or something, somewhere around there. Keep going down in temperature and the light becomes redder and redder and redder until it gets to a deep enough of a red that your eye can't even see it. Now, visible light, like the sun produces, or perhaps this flashlight produces, is white light. White light, visible light, ranges from around 400 to 700 nanometers in wavelength. 400 is blue, and 700 is red. You mix them all together, and it's kind of whitish in color. It's not what your eye perceives it as anyways. Anything longer than 700 nanometers, your eye just can't detect. It just doesn't have the, the right sensitivity to it. This thermal imager, on the other hand, it's sensitive to light that is much, much longer in wavelengths, somewhere around 7,500 nanometers all the way up to 14,000 nanometers. So what's special about that wavelength range? Well, ordinary objects, ordinary temperatures, like let's say this teacup here, glow in infrared light at a room temperature of somewhere around 10,000 nanometers or so. And if you were to heat it up, let's say you pour some hot water in it, it's now going to glow with a wavelength of roughly 8,000 nanometers. Of course, the outside of the cup isn't warm enough yet, but it's warming up. Let me demonstrate that this coffee mug is actually glowing in infrared light. Let's throw this here on the infrared imager, and now turn the lights out. Notice there's no change in the image. That infrared light is actually be being generated by that coffee cup. Let's examine the external anatomy of this little beast. It's pistol style, it has a trigger, a business end, a little screen. It's, it's immediately intuitive to use. You know exactly what you do. You point it somewhere, you pull the trigger, you look at the little screen. There's nothing else to it. There's no other little buttons, there's no little nobules, no little switches or anything like that. There's absolutely no ambiguity as to what exactly you're supposed to do with this little tool. The rubberized grip, the plastic, seems to be typical of Wilmucky tools. Seems very solid, very, very rigid. I'm pretty sure that this would survive a fall off a ladder. At least the casing will. The internals, well, maybe we'll find out when we open it up. Here's the business end. Notice that there's no lens cover or anything like that, but it is recessed and it wouldn't be that easy to get dirty. You'd have to like take your grubby finger and stick it in there and smush it around. I don't think anybody's going to do that. My experience with tiny little lenses that are recessed like this is they don't really get dirty anyways. And if they do, it's only just a little bit of dust and something like a blower bulb is usually adequate to take care of it. 
If you really need to clean this lens, use a Q-tip that's wetted with alcohol. Make sure that's not dripping wet. Don't use acetone, which is sometimes recommended for lenses because well, there's plastic around the lens and that might that might react badly with the acetone. So infrared light goes through that lens and is focused onto the imaging chip. Around the lens is a plastic ring, including these little blind holes in the plastic, which I have no idea what they do. If you have any idea, let me know in the comments. I'd be fascinated to find out. They, I don't know, they look like they're just for decoration to me. They're like speed holes to make it go faster. Oh, it's the faint clicking noise. We'll need to investigate that later on. So opposite the business end is the little LCD display. Not too much to say about it. It's pretty basic. It's bright and it's not very big, but it's big enough. It is surrounded by a rubber over molded plastic part that does help protect it from bangs. Good for throwing it in a toolbox. The only thing about these rubber over molds is that they do tend to be dust magnets. And while well, the screen I do find tends to get dust fairly often. So I always keep a little blower around and well, that helps out with that. Here's an annoying little bug in the system. Occasionally this imager goes bonkers and it, 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 there got to be some bug in the software. And the only way to resolve it is you got to release the trigger and then wait 10 seconds until the display clears. So the only real complaint I can make is the battery compartment. You need a screwdriver to open it. And that's a little bit annoying. It really should just be thumb operated. Twist the screwdriver, pop the battery out. Second little niggly point. Why is the battery on a terminal like this, a wired terminal? It should just be slide in and clip in. It'd be so much easier. These little wire terminals, first of all, they're a weak point. Second of all, you can't use them with gloves. You can't use them if, you're, if your hands are freezing cold. That said, I do like the choice of using 9 volt batteries. Here I got a little rechargeable nickel methyl hydride. Get a handful of these and get yourself a smart charger that actually properly charges them and, and relatively quickly. These things I find they're very useful because I have so many different instruments that all use 9 volt batteries and I, I have like only about 3 or 4 of these rechargeables and that's enough for me. I just swap them from tool to tool. Which is again why I don't like these little wired battery terminals. If you get yourself rechargeable batteries, make sure that you get the low self-discharge models or the pre-charged like this one here says. Basically what that means is that it, it, it can sit in your toolbox for a couple days or weeks or months or even a year or more and, and it still holds most of the charge. Yeah, these rechargeables are fantastic and I like that they used a 9 volt battery in here because, well, if your battery does die and you're out in an important mission, you can just go to a grocery store and get yourself an alkaline. Now inside the battery compartment we find the only complication to the user interface. That's a little switch right here for French or English. Uh, permit me a minor diatribe. Did you know that the French wanted to make everything divisible by tens or hundreds? Centigrades, centimeters, centiliters, and centigrams. Even the cent from money came from metrification. They were absolutely bent on rationalizing the physical world around them, even suggesting that the provinces of France should be all the same size or be geometrically divided. Absolute craziness. They did not stop to think whatsoever that base 12 or base 16 could actually be useful. Think about it. What's a third of a foot? What's a half a foot? What's a quarter of a foot? Take a fluid ounce, double it twice, you get a cup. Double that again, you get a pint, double that, and you get a quart. Double that twice, and you get a gallon. Everything divided by ten. Nonetheless, mindset to French. Thanks, Trudeau the Senior. Let's shuck this clamshell open and see the gooey bits inside. To remove the battery door, we gotta get this pin out. A hex driver is pretty handy for that. You can get the right size to push it through. There's the pin. Steel in color. See if it's magnetic. No, nope, it doesn't stick to a magnet, so it's probably stainless steel. Now the battery door just comes off like that, and inside we can see a little foam block to keep the battery from rattling around. And see here the mechanism for locking. There is a plastic identifier there. It says PA6 GF30 TPE. PA6 is polyamide 6, which is a type of nylon. 
very, very durable, good plastic to begin with. And GF30 means that it has 30% glass fiber in the plastic that makes it really stiff and really, really tough stuff. TPE is thermoplastic elastomer, which refers to the overmold. Thermoplastic elastomer is a mix of rubber, a synthetic rubber, and some type of plastic, usually styrene. And, and what that does is each material gives this overmold a special characteristic. The, 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 the rubber component, while it makes it elastic and, and stretchy and, and squishy, and the plastic component, the styrene, uh, lends it a, a, a moldability. It can be melted, and then it can be injected into a mold, a complex mold, to create this rather sophisticated shape. Torx screws are nice because they don't cam out like Phillips screws, but you do need to be a little bit careful because it's easy to oversize your driver. And when you do so, like with this T9, it, it fits in, but it's only seating at the very top of the fastener. It's not going all the way down to the bottom. In actuality, th this screw is a T8, and I don't have a T8 because a lot of a lot of sets of Torx drivers only go down to T9. But this T8 bit, let me fit it in, and you can see that it seats all the way down to the bottom, and there's no slop. Six fasteners to hold it together. It seems that falls off of a ladder onto a concrete floor. We're in the designer's mind. And the reveal. Let's start with where the meat bag meets the machine. The trigger directly depresses onto this little tactile switch. The trigger has these little plastic standoffs, which are presumably to prevent an overzealous trigger finger from stressing the circuit board. But there must have been a miscommunication in the various engineering departments at Wilmaki, as these standoffs, they don't bottom out. So now that we have it flayed open, we can take a look at the plastics. As is expected, this is also a PA6 GF30 TPE. Now, curiously, the business end and the display end use a different sort of plastic. This is PA66 GF30 TPE. Why they used a different sort of plastic, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's just, maybe they come from different manufacturing plants. That's, that's my guess. Possibly it's due to some sort of superior property of PA66. I'll not look too much into this board. It's just major digital. But one thing is noticeable. All of these test points, there's 35 of them and a couple different connectors. I wonder if the Made in USA refers to the programming and calibration of this device. Perhaps some sort of sophisticated machinery is only available in USA. And now into the inner sanctum. Before I go any further, I'm going to try to be really fast to reduce the chances of dust getting inside. I hate working with optics, as this is clearly not a clean room that I'm in. I've thought about getting some sort of lamin or flow hood or making one, but it's really bulky, and I don't know, I only use it a couple times a year. Let me know in the comments if you have any tips for clean room work at home. So here we see the chip, and the chip is hidden a little bit behind that shutter. The purpose of the shutter is to present a blank reference face for the chip, so that the, all the pixels can be zeroed. The shutter is then in turn connected to an electromagnet, and the electromagnet is, it flicks the shutter in front of the, of the chip and, and, and away from the chip. Uh, that, that electromagnet working is what's making the, the clicking noise that you occasionally hear when this tool's operating. I couldn't find any markings on this chip, so I don't know where it comes from. I tried the Googletron, and I didn't come up with any results for a 102 by 77 uh, pixel microbolometer array. I just couldn't find any. The lens unit has this little rubber condom on it, a plastic retainer. It seems to be made of cast zinc. See the lens in there. Whatever the pedigree of the sensor is, it appears to have identical specs to the sensor used by the Fluke 279 FC. So hopefully that translates into quality and durability. Speaking of durability, that little dangly shutter thing in there seems to be the most fragile element in this unit, and likely the weak point for a fall off a ladder. And back together it is. Okay, so what do you use the thermal imager for? I'm not telling you. Go figure it out for yourself. But I'll tell you what to expect out of a thermal imaging camera. First thing is that you can measure temperature. Sorta. It's not very accurate. And the accuracy is highly dependent on the surface of the object that's being measured. 
Most matte surfaces, think wood, concrete, painted surfaces, they'll be accurate down to a degree or so. Not bad. But accuracy worsens with glossy surfaces, transparent surfaces, it becomes completely unreliable on metallic surfaces. The reason for this is that emissivity and reflectivity of surfaces vary. How much of the object radiates versus how much of the object is just reflecting infrared light from elsewhere. Take the centigrade door. The painted wood can be measured relatively accurately, but the glass is both emitting as well as reflecting infrared light. Notice my reflection. Also, keep in mind that glass is completely opaque to infrared light. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you can measure through windows or walls or something like that. Reality is not a spy flick. Metal becomes completely unreliable. See how this pegboard is matte galvanized? It's not reflective and visible light at all. But in infrared, it's just showing the temperature of the surroundings. Again, notice my reflection. I used might be evaluating your HVAC ducts, but notice how this duct, which is warm to the touch, is just reflecting the cold basement floor. Where a thermal imager excels at them, showing tiny variations in temperature. It's an extremely precise instrument, but it's not accurate. It's precise. Precision is a different concept than accuracy. Check out this plywood worktop. I put my hand down. The heat signature. It's still there. That is what makes an infrared imager so useful. It's being able to see a tiny effect when tiny effects have consequence. Let's hook it up and see how many leptons are leaping through these electronicals. Batteries at about 8.8 .8 volts. Seems to be about 75 milliamps, which would divide into 500 milliamps for roughly six hours of runtime on a typical alkaline battery. About two thirds of that for a good rechargeable, maybe four hours. That seems plenty to me, because really, all you're going to do is you're going to point, you're going to shoot, you're going to look maybe a couple of minutes at a time. Eh, last a long time. So do I have room for this tool? Hell yeah! It gets an exalted position in a drawer within arm's reach of the captain's chair. Until next time, there'll be more room for tools.